And um, for anyone who's popping onto this Facebook Live or this webinar, I just want to say hi. I'm really happy to have you along today for what I know will be a really valuable conversation for either you or someone in your life that you know and love. As today we discuss how to enhance your recovery with self-care post-caesarean section birth. Caesarean accounts for close to 30% of births in Australia. Some are planned and some are unscheduled and we're big believers in everyone preparing for them so you can have as positive as an empowering experience as possible no matter what type of birth you have. I'm Rebecca McQueen from Birth Sense Australia. Today I'm joined by Leonie Rastus, a nurse and midwife and fellow of the Australian College of Nursing who specialises in postpartum recovery after caesarean birth. Welcome Leonie. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. It's really lovely to have you here. And um, look, for anyone who's listening, Leonie is the founding director of CaesarCare.com. It's an online platform for education and resources to help women and their carers understand their surgery and the healing process. So Leonie teaches online childbirth education for women scheduled for or recovering from emergency caesarean birth and scheduled as uh, cesarean birth, so all cesarean birth. She's the author of a variety of post-op recovery guides and the ebook Woman-Centered Cesarean Care. She also has designed a wound splint called the SAC splint to support and help protect the surgical wound from breakdown during sudden movement, such as coughing, sneezing or laughter. So, um, Leonie, we discussed yesterday that, as you know, a little while ago now, I spoke to a Melbourne obstetrician, Dr. King, about what to expect in a cesarean section. And today I'm really looking forward to adding to that conversation by sharing information from you around what women can expect post-operatively. It's great work you're doing. And thank you for being here to share your wisdom with us. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to it, Beck. I um I guess um, my passion for um, working with women after caesarean birth is born out of my own experience, both my professional practice and my own um, experience of, of birthing my six children by C-section. Um, in the day I, um, when I, in 1980, when I had my first baby, um, they were doing X-ray pelvimetry then to, to check the size of the pelvis and as I hadn't come into labour um, by 42 weeks um, that uh, I was to be induced but um, the head was too high so um, I was then sent for x-ray and it was decided then that um, that would be my um, mode of birth from, from then on so um, yeah I went on to have another Five and um, I guess my nursing um, background really helped me um, being able to care for for my incision and, and scar afterwards. And um, I'm very passionate about uh, helping women in the early days, particularly with the um, supporting the wound, and which is what led me to designing the um, dedicated splint because um, you know what one, one of the things that was drilled into us in our nursing school was anyone um, after abdominal surgery should have a, a cushion or a rolled up towel to hold against the stitches for any sudden movement and um, to be able to sort of just protect and ease the discomfort and um, and you know protect against uh, any uh, tension and break or potential breakdown of the stitches so that's sort of what drives me in addition to that I'm the insights that I've gained from um, social media cesarean support groups really worries me with their lack of knowledge that some women have um, uh, there's all manner of wounds pictures of wounds being posted, asking, is this normal, is this okay? Um, just a lot of questions that really women, you know, I feel should should know, should be given the information at some stage. Now, um, antenatally, uh, I know now that 
that we are beginning to run classes for cesarean birth, but um, I know when I taught antenatal classes in a hospital setting, uh, there was very little. We glossed over cesarean birth as if that was just something we didn't want to think about. Um, and then I know from the early days after birth, just how um, adult um, from the the pain relief medication and the capacity to take on information, vital information about wound care is is a, is a bit diminished. Um, there's the excitement of the new baby, the visitors, the um, foggy mind and all of that makes it very difficult to impart this um, really important information to women. So that's really what has led me to setting up Caesar Care to be able to reach women in their homes. I love that you're drawing on your personal experience of six caesareans yourself, as well as your nursing experience for wound care and your midwifery experience. So it's a great combination of skills and, and um, experience that you're bringing to women who really do need this information. And it always amazes me that there's not more education out there for caesarean, considering one in three women will have one. And not everybody plans to, but sometimes that can be the way it goes. So getting the information before the caesarean, uh, if it's required, is is so vital. So this is going to be such great information to, to impart to those women out there, whether they're planning a caesarean or not, everyone should listen to this talk just in case. So, um, so Leone, with, with um, your skills and your experience, what is it you think are the most important things that women and their partners need to know regarding the immediate post-op period? Well, I think, um, you know, that the whole procedure, the, the surgical procedure of, of caesarean, you know, being wide awake, um, having five layers cut through, I think that's an important thing to know that it's, um, it does take five layers to get to the baby. So we start with the, the skin, the fat layer, the muscle, the peritoneum, and then the, the uterine wall, the muscle. So um, that's quite, it's a major surgery. So that's really important to, to respect that the, the, uh, the procedure is major. And often, um, you know, the women feel quite um, emotional about that, you know, just the whole event. Um, and then often women have an uncontrollable shake in the theatre after, and, and it can last for a bit longer. That's quite normal. Not really 100% sure why that happens. However, the body does have memory and maybe just the fact that, you know, the, the scalpel has, you know, cut had to cut through those layers. Maybe that's the body's reaction. Um, we're not sure. Some think it might be to the anaesthetic, but um, so that 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 might be happening um, immediately afterwards. If you've um, talked with your doctor about immediate skin to skin, you may be able to hold hold the baby in theatre. The baby may be able even to have a breastfeed in theatre. That really just depends on the baby's condition, whether it was an emergency or an elective and everything's okay. So that that's something that may or may not happen. Um, after baby's born, it doesn't take that long to sew the layers back and then you'll be um, taken out into a recovery room with your midwife and um, your partner and that's um, a time where you th you'll be closely observed probably for 30 to 60 minutes um, where your um, stitches will be checked regularly and um, your fundus to make sure that um, there's no um, bleeding or, or you know, retained um, products, uh, things like that, that could be causing um, a, a bleed. 
So there's a bit that goes on there, blood pressures. So that that's the sort of um, thing to expect. You will probably be given some oral pain um, relief in recovery before transfer down to the ward. Um, you'll still have a urinary catheter in that is either inserted in theatre or um, just before you go to to theatre. So that'll be connected to a bag so you won't need to use the bathroom for about 12 hours that usually stays in the, the um, catheter into the bladder. Um, research is suggesting that the earlier that you can get up um, after birth, after caesarean, the better, after any um, abdominal surgery actually. So um, as early as six hours. So providing the, you've got the feeling back in your legs and you've got adequate pain relief, it is really good to think about um, getting up and having a short walk. And getting up is, um, an art in itself. It's really important to to shuffle onto your side before you get up. If you've got an electronic bed to um, elevate the back of the bed and on your side to um, put your, um, your hand from your upper side against the mattress and push yourself up and just taking time um, before you actually stand. And that's where the wound support comes in really handy if you've got a rolled up towel or a cushion or a dedicated splint you can actually support the wound and um, it reduces some of that fear that I'm going to burst open if I move because that rarely happens um, if you've got good pain relief on board and good wound support you can um, you can move quite freely so I think um, that's something to to look forward to rather than dread because the sooner you move the sooner those muscles start doing their work again and not sort of just um, you know being stiff and um, tight so um, yeah uh, another um, thing that I always advise um, women and their partners is to try and um, limit visitors in that first 24 hours. I know it's really exciting, but the body has been through major surgery and it's really um, exhausting to be having a room full of visitors, even though you might be pain free and you look as if, um, you know, you you haven't just come from theatre. Um, just, just be kind to yourself if you can. Um, and and delay the visitors would be my best advice. I've seen women absolutely inundated with with visitors, and it can really set them back a few days because it's just you know that the high activity and energy in the room is is, is really exhausting. Um, so that would be something that I would um, recommend you think about. How long, Leonie? Should should people wait post-op before they think about having visitors in? Oh, look, I think the next day, absolutely the next day, I do see, you know, some people have visitors within an hour of returning from recovery. But um, a good 12 hours would be great if, if that's possible, um, you know, to wait. The benefits, are, you know, in, in the long run, um, and, and with social media these days, I mean, you can have, um, you know, photos out within no time. People can, can see the baby and, and maybe just um, delay their visit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always amazed by that. If it was any other surgery, no one would ever dream to pop in and just have a big old chat to you an hour after major surgery. But when there's a baby involved, all rules go out the window in that department, which is an interesting cultural observation. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I understand the excitement and, um, you know, Dad and Mum wanting to share the good news and and the baby, but, um, yeah, it, it can slow recovery, I think.
Okay, that's a great tip. Are there any other things or um, tips that you would mention that, that are great for parents to know prior to a cesarean birth? Um, just to, you know, the, the, the whole theatre scene is very um, stark, sterile and cold. Um, that it's important that the temperature in theatre is not too hot because the surgeons and the nurses and, and theatre technicians are all gowned and, um, you know, in, in layers of clothing and we don't want them fainting. So they do happen, you know, have to have a cooler environment. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not pretty with all the stainless steel and, um, you know, white and bright lights but it's it's a very temporary passage you know if you're lucky you might be out within an hour or even less depending on the speed of your doctor yes yeah. i think that the information you've given too about the shaking is really great for parents to hear that it's common we don't know why it happens but it's nothing to worry about mm. is that right yeah yes definitely and it, and it passes it, it's just um very common. Okay, okay. So um, the idea of getting out of bed soon as you possibly can post-op, is that something that hospitals are bringing into their protocols generally around the place? Well, I've worked at probably seven different units and I haven't actually seen any protocols. I think it's... Um, you know, if you have an evening caesarean, it may be next day. If you have a morning one, it would be in the afternoon. So it really depends, I think, on, um, yeah, just the different uh, facilities, what their routine is. But um, I used to think it was kind to leave um, women, you know, in bed a bit longer after a caesarean, just, you know, bearing in mind the major surgery. However, um, I guess by the, by the sixth cesarean, I realised the, the importance and the joy of that first shower. That is the most amazing experience. And I really encourage women to look forward to that first shower. It, you might feel like you're at the foot of the mountain to get there, but once you're there, um, most bathrooms have shower chairs. So you can sit if it's, um, you know, too exhausting to stand. But that hot water on the muscles is just amazing. And the, the dressings are usually waterproof. Um, you know, it doesn't matter about the catheter. If your catheter hasn't been removed, that's okay. That's waterproof too. So there's no, and even the, the IV, if you've still got um, a drip in, which is often the intravenous catheter is often left in until you are eating and drinking satisfactorily. So you may have all those gadgets still um, connected, but that shouldn't stop you from having the best shower of your life. <laughs> and I often say there's no water restrictions after a cesarean. So just um, enjoy that warm water on your, on your muscles that have all been tense and tight prior to, it's very normal to, to feel uptight prior to surgery, um, but you don't know, get in there and get those knots um, moving with the hot water. It's my best advice. Great advice. Some people may be wondering about the epidural. How does it? How do you get up when you've got an epidural in post-op? So could you just talk us through how that works? Yeah. Well, um, in the, with the observations after um, the cesarean. We, we check regularly how um, the, whether, what level the numbness is and it, it only takes a few hours for the sensation to come back. So once you can really feel your toes and move your, your toes and move your legs, then we, we test um, whether you're stable to be able to walk. So that, that's only a, a few hours, well within the six hours, I would say. Okay. So, Leonie, of course, the reason a lot of women will be reluctant to get up is because they fear the pain that's going to come with, mm. with doing that. Um, when we spoke yesterday, you mentioned 
pain and pain points post cesarean. Oh. Would you be able to go through that in a little more detail with everyone? Yes, well, um, most people would think that uh, with the cesarean, there's there's only the the scar, the the wound that that hurts. However, when I was writing a, a blog about pain points, I I even surprised was surprised myself to discover there's something like fifteen potential pain points associated with cesarean birth. And I started from top to toe. And so running through those, I can talk about the um, headache that can be caused by the ep epidural. There can be a really um, uncomfortable headache that can follow. And um, that will resolve itself within 24 hours or so. However, um, there is a procedure called a blood patch that can be um, performed by the anaesthetist where he takes some blood from the arm and injects it into the, um, the area to create a patch and, um, you know, stop the pain. So that, that's not that common, but I have seen that happen. So know that there, um, there is a remedy if, if you're feeling that, um, that headache. Um, so you're meaning that the anethis will take some blood from the arm and inject it into the epidural site? Yes. To, yeah, to stop yeah. the leaking of the fluid that causes the headache? That's right. Okay. Yeah. It's just like a patch. Um, I suppose like a bike tyre, really. Um, Very clever. A, a puncture of the bike, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then... Um, if you have had to have a general anaesthetic, there may be some throat um, irritation from uh, the general, from the intubation, from the tube, the breathing tube that goes down. There can be a little bit of, um, you know, uh, discomfort there, which can be um, remedied with ice chips or, um, you know, a lozenge. But... We don't see a lot of general anaesthetics these days, so that's just a potential um, pain point. The next one, which often um, worries women, is the shoulder tip pain. Why am I getting pain in my shoulder when I've had, you know, the surgery down um, in the lower abdomen? Well, at the time of birth, there's a lot of... Um, air can get into the abdominal cavity and um, that create, takes up space which pushes up on the diaphragm and the nerves, the diaphragm which is below the lungs and separating the lungs from the stomach and the abdominal organs. So that, that pressure um, of the trapped air can um, trigger pain in the shoulder tip. And that can be really worrying, but it, it's temporary until the air dissipates. Um, you you can perhaps use a hot pack or um, some peppermint tea uh, might help to relieve that. So that's a another um, un probably unexpected pain that may be felt. So moving down, um, we've got the the abdominal bloating, which causes the shoulder tip pain, um, which can be really uncomfortable. And so it's really important to forget your manners and to pass that wind as quickly as you can. Um, sometimes a gentle um, massage from the right um, groin up across across under the ribs and down the left just um, circular motions with your hand can help to move that gas along and um, give you some relief so that's very important um, that's a hard one for for women who are in a shared room that's the last <laughs> thing you want to do <laughs> absolutely mm. um, another good exercise I found helped was um, yoga breathing where you do the really deep breathing um, and then 
um, you can actually pop your hand behind your back and as you exhale suck that lower back in down into the bed and that can be really helpful also but these these are uh, problems that um, usually only last a couple of um, couple of days um, constipation can also add to the um, the discomfort so I notice that a lot of doctors these days are prescribing um, appearance fairly early so if you um, are accustomed to taking something for um, constipation then it would be good to continue that but lots of fluid is really important um, so and also um, when you go to the bathroom take your cushion or your towel or your splint and place that across um, across your lap and lean into it um, you know just to and the other really good tip is the best anatomical position for opening your bowels is with your knees elevated um, above the hip line so if you've got a footstool that you can pop your toes on and just have your knees a little bit higher have your wound splint on your lap lean into it you'll have um, far more success so that's just a um, an anatomical trick to facilitate the bowels opening um, it, you know um, I remember feeling really scared that I was going to burst open you know the first time but and that's why that um, splint cushion or towel is really important to have on your lap that's such a great they're all great practical tips to just make the difference to take the fear out of anything that's going on for you they're such practical measures so they're, they're fantastic are they the the 15 points have you covered them all i'm still moving down oh. um well i did miss the the iv site that may um you know, hopefully not, but it, it can shift out of position and it become tissued and quite painful. So if you notice any throbbing or um, redness around the intravenous catheter, report that because that can be repositioned um, if, if necessary. So, and then also the, um, the urinary catheter, um, it's that that can be uncomfortable as well so um it, it doesn't the, it shouldn't register as pain when that's removed but that's a potential um pain site um then we have the wound of course um the the stitches you know that the um in that early in the early days the inflammatory phase where there's increased blood supply and um, from and bruising um, sometimes baby's head is deep down in the pelvis and has to be lifted out with forceps or there could be a lot of pulling and pushing to get baby out so um, you, you can feel that bruising pain from bruising so in addition to the um, pain relief that you'll be given, usually the oral tablets, um, uh, the heavy duty painkillers, you might be a, a, able to get some relief from an ice pack because wherever there's heat and swelling, the ice is going to help to reduce that. So that's another good tip to remember. And I often say to women, take, take your own ice pack because I think you probably um, agree, Rebecca, um, ice packs do tend to have legs in hospitals. It's often hard to find them. So if you have your own, that could be a good trick. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things I encourage people to take in with them to birth suite and, and for post-op too. So um, with regards to the pain you're, you're speaking about, what would be your advice when women are offered pain relief? Because sometimes I know it's, been, oh, no, I'm, I'm okay. I don't want it. I don't want to take those things. What's your advice around that in those first couple of days post-op particularly? Well, 
I just say there are no medals for bravery and to skip a dose is really setting yourself up for a horror night's sleep or just, um, you know, like the, the regime that's ordered by the anaesthetist is well thought out and um, often they do, the, they have the narcotics is for the early days and they'll be ordered anything from two to four hourly and then the paracetamol will be ordered six hourly and then Nurofen and Voltaren uh, maybe eight hourly, six to eight hourly. So there's a lot of thought got into the, um, you know, the routine of pain relief and it's really important um, not to skip a dose and, and even I go as far as to say write down when you had your last dose, be one step ahead, you know, we can get caught up, um, you know, we, with with other work, but you, just buzz, if you know you're due for your medication or you've got pain breaking through, just buzz and ask because, as I say, there's no medals and it really makes a difference to your feeding, to your comfort, to your general well-being it's it's just really important and it's it's only a, a week or two that you're going to need to be relying on um medication you know ice packs and um wound support uh can help um yeah. where yeah. once you're home yes it really is about keeping in front of the pain rather than trying to chase it isn't it because then you can get into this whole oh, i'm trying to catch up trying to catch up it's a pain cycle mm. that can spiral down it stops you getting out of bed it's all those things that can impact on so um it's Absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah yeah so i'm thinking now we're down to um the uh even just cradling baby can can cause pain, um, particularly if you if you want to cradle baby in front of you. The, just the weight of the baby mm -hmm. can um, cause it, you know, exacerbate the pain around the wound site. So it's really good if you can get to um, comfortable with feeding baby lying beside you. If you can get the midwives to show you how to feed, how to prop. The baby have the cot side up and prop the baby beside you um certainly in in bed that that's a really good in what if you're sitting in a chair you might have a pillow or, or some sort of protection across um your lap but um yeah that that's that's can cause discomfort um the afterbirth pains particularly if you've had um, you know, second and subsequent babies, every time you um, let down, breast, if you're breastfeeding, you, you get cramping, period-like pains. And um, so I always say make sure, you know, you've got your paracetamol on board before, before a feed, if hopefully they, they'll time together. Um, the... The calves and the thighs can be another area that um, may have pain um, from clots. Very rare that the, the uh, clots would form in the thighs, but often in the calves, we get um, women can get uh, what's called deep vein thrombosis, which um, really needs urgent treatment because um, we don't want that those clots traveling anywhere we want them dissolved so if you're um, feeling any um, pain or heat um, in, in any either of your calves report that immediately that's that's a pain that should be treated okay. um, Ankles. Ankles can become really tight. You may not have had any swelling or edema in your ankles prior to um, birth, but uh, particularly a caesarean birth, uh, there's a lot of intravenous fluids uh, um, infused 
in theatre. So you've got a lot of extra fluid on board and it takes a while um, for the heart to catch up and, and pump, pump it all and out. So you might find ankles being um, tight and uncomfortable. I know after my last, I look at photos of the whole family sitting there and I'm there with these great big elephant ankles. I couldn't believe myself. Um, thankfully, it took, you know, a few days to go. So the other pain, the final pain, is um, it can be emotional or spiritual distress, depending on um, the circumstances, particularly with emergency surgery or with, um, you know, an anaesthetic that may have been incomplete. Um, the, these things can cause a lot of pain and really need to be addressed, preferably um, speaking to a specialist um, before before you go home, having a, a good debrief and, and understanding why things happen to help um, make sense of things is really important for emotional and spiritual pain. Yeah, I'm really glad you... Sorry, what were you going to say? No, no, no. So that's actually um, the the list, the full list. I haven't... No, I'm, I'm really pleased that you brought up the uh, emotional psychological side of things um, post cesarean because birth is emotional and uh, whether it's cesarean or it's it's unassisted, it doesn't matter what sort of birth you have, um, there will be considerations that, that women and their partners and medical providers need to consider around um, emotional health and psychological health. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? And you've said, you know, if you're struggling to, of course, speak to a specialist, but um, is there anything specifically you'd like to, to address around the emotional side of things? Well, I think um, just having the opportunity to talk or to, to journal your thoughts and feelings is really important because it can really distract you from enjoying the baby you know and particularly if you're ruminating over what happened and why did it happen and um, will it ever happen again and things like that it's just really really important to acknowledge that and not think it will go away because um, you know sometimes sometimes you can um, be numb to the um, the situation sometimes things can be have been very distressing and you might get um you know a period where there's there's no effect but it three weeks three months six months down the track it may revisit and i think that that's um why i'm very attuned to that because um one of my cesareans was um there was a, a live one live segment and um, I, I felt a lot of that, um, the, the cutting and the pulling and, and it was really quite distressing and it was about three months after I, um, after he was born that I read a report, a, a woman describing her failed anaesthetic and saying it felt like um, a hot knife cutting through butter. And that was it. That just took me right back. And it took me a while to um, unpack and repack that whole situation. So um, just be aware of that. That um, And also the partner can be very distressed as well, especially if, you know, that there's been some, you know, major sort of um, difficulty around the, the cesarean. So just um, it may be that it's important that both mum and partner have an opportunity to to talk it out um, so they can move on. 
Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. So there's some great resources out there now for parents. If, if um, you know, you're finding that maybe you've had a cesarean experience or um, just to know in the back of your mind that you can call um, Panda or you can call the Gidget Foundation. Um, there's the Australian Birth Trauma Association. There's quite a number of free resources out there for parents as well as chatting to people who um, you can go through and debrief your your birth experience with a, a psychologist or um, your doctor you know there's just just put your hand up don't just sit there and think you have to you put up with the thoughts that are maybe um, impacting on you because by not actioning those thoughts and going around and around your brain, sometimes that can have a, a detrimental effect to your mental health. So um, please sing out if, if there's some trauma associated with your birth experience. Don't just think, well, that's just normal. That's just the way it is. It's, it's a good time to chat it out. We've certainly got great resources in Australia. Most of them are listed on our handy contacts page there um, on our website, Birth Since Australia website. So, um, with regards to, we've spoken about um, what, what to expect in those immediate days post-op, Leonie. Can we move down the track a little bit more and talk about uh, when you're discharged from hospital, what are some of the key tips for managing at home with your self-care? Okay, well, I think, um, like, it's often very hard to distinguish between day and night for a while, especially when you're doing feeding round the clock and to lose track of time. I think to have a, a, a planner, whether it's on your phone or in a diary, just to keep track of um, your medication, how much you've been drinking, um, the feeding time, um, any appointments just to just to keep you on track because as I say it's very um, particularly when you're taking um, medication too that can make you a bit foggy so um, actually writing your um, daily timetable down or having a checklist writing down things as they come to you particularly little jobs that um you want to get to but you 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 one you don't have the um energy and or the strength or you're not allowed to lift and so you can pop those on a list and if you have visitors pop in and they say what can i do to help you've got it on the list you can just say oh look that corner has been driving me mad could you just run the vacuum over it you know i remember thinking that so many times if only i could because what we know is that um, it is really important not to, to put any tension on your wound through lifting or doing any heavy um, household duties for five to six weeks because you have to remember the five guide. We've got the, you know, the, the skin, the fat, the muscle, the peritoneum and the uterine muscle all cut through, all needing to heal taking about five weeks so you know often we just say to the mums now go home and take it easy or that's you know we've just got to take it easy but it's really really important that you don't do anything that can compromise um, your wound and the scar formation and between two and eight percent of women who have cesarean births actually have some level of breakdown in the stitches so that is um, largely avoidable if you take good care of the muscle groups um, and um, not place any extra tension through through lifting so there's three main causes of um, stitches bursting open at you know, maybe one stitch or three or four, um, and, and they are the um, mechanical from raised intra-abdominal pressure when you cough and sneeze and, and even laugh. So that's why it's so important to hold a barrier there to counter that forward thrust when you cough, sneeze or laugh. Then there's tension from, from lifting 
and then there's delayed wound, wound healing that um, for whatever reason there may be um, particularly for for women who smoke for diabetics there can be delayed wound healing um, and even um, hypothermia um, hopefully you wouldn't be suffering from that but that all those things can delay the healing which can um, you know lead to the, the stitches popping open so um, I think that's really important um, that you be very very respectful of that healing zone in your body and not compromise um, energy you know it it is major surgery so it takes time to get your strength back and your confidence back and that's okay um, finding ways to to limit your uh, walking and um, you know duplicating you forgetting things in one room I used to have this little lightweight backpack and I'd put my, my breast pads in it my drink bottle um, and anything else you know my my notebook my, my journal anything else in that and I'd cut that around so that I was hands free to hold the baby um, and those sort of uh, tricks can be really helpful to um, in in the early days and of course the afternoon feeds if you can discipline yourself to feed lying on the bed you know you can your body's in rest mode and it's so much easier to feed um, without having you know the baby kicking your stitches or just have a little cushion in between yourself and the baby lying on your side and that can be really a very good restful opportunity mm -hmm. Great idea with the backpack, saves you walking room to room looking for different things. Yeah. They're, they're really good tips. Any other tips in those um, those weeks post caesarean birth? You mentioned visitors, get putting them to work. I think that's a great idea. Yes, um, definitely. Just the little list and a nice little sign for the door, mother and baby sleeping, whether or not they are doesn't really matter. But if you need time, me time um, just pop that note out um, and accepting help not just accepting help asking for help you have permission to ask for a meal if someone want, offers to help they mean business they want something to do so be ready with um, some ideas of course we're in this wonderful age where um, if we can order online so maybe <coughs> um, ordering groceries online can help help sorry you're all right it's okay yeah Coles online is best thing ever <laughs> I love it <laughs> and speaking of technology another fantastic idea is um, the meal train idea I don't know if you've heard of that where um, an organizer says well this person's had a baby what meals do you want to do what day and it's all coordinated so you're not getting 10 lasagnas all at the one time so there's another way technology can really help out in those post op days as well mm. um, I think they're the main uh, things is sleep I mean expressing uh, there's a theory that every hour of sleep before midnight is worth two after midnight so in the early days if your milk supply if you're breastfeeding and your milk supply is really good to be able to freeze some and then maybe your partner can do the late feed so that you can um, bank a few hours of sleep before midnight i think that's a really good one mm. and, um, uh, one study um, uh, about sleep and rest um, identified that women get their best sleep between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. and that even changed practice in the hospital where the research was done so that women weren't woken for their breakfast that they were um, free to use the pantry and make their breakfast when they were uh, after they'd finished their um, 
their gold sleep. Mm. Is that true of all women or is that just post having a baby? With I that? think that's in the early days, you know, probably when you're doing the night feeds because if you're doing a feed at about, you know, say 3 o'clock and you get back to sleep by 4, mm. then, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know whether it's biorhythms or, or what, but I have, um, I've heard that. It's important, the important sleep. Yeah, great. Again, really great practical tips. Um, any tips that are specifically for the partner and what partners can really do here to, to help with recovery? Well, I, um, I was very blessed. My partner got up um, for all of the night feeds and brought the baby to me so that I didn't have to you know, bend in the middle and put up with the discomfort. He was just wonderful. So he 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 changed all the babies and um, and put them back to bed after the feed. So if if that's at all possible, that's um, really really helpful. Lots of points for that one for the partners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Leone, going back to the wound care side of things. Um, what do you think that women and partners need to be aware of around wound management? You've mentioned splinting and, um, you know, like lots of great tips, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about specifically with your nursing hat on around wound management? Yeah, well, um, I know there's thousands of creams and things on the market at the moment for for scars, but... Um, I think that you know wound wound cleansing is the most important just to be able to gently wash in the bath or the shower and pat dry. Uh, there was a practice of drying the stitches with um, or the wound with a hair dryer. However, um, that's got out of fashion because um, believing that heating the area could encourage um, bacteria growth. So we, we prefer not now to use the hairdryer, just a patting dry with, the, um, with a clean towel. And then maybe, um, if possible, just lying down and airing the wound for a while. Some, sometimes, you know, there's an overhang in the first um, few weeks. So just to be able to, to lift that off the stitches to get some, you know, fresh air. Yeah. That. Is sun a good thing to think about if you can hop out in the sun for a bit? Well, this, the, um, di any direct exposure to the sun is, is not advised for the first three to nine months after surgery because... Um, as the wound heals, the, the new skin is very sensitive. So probably not direct sunlight, but maybe, um, you know, near a window near would be okay. Excellent. Um, so uh, the cleansing and then wound dressings. Um, there's also a myriad of dressings on the market for, um, for wounds. Um, but... The, the purpose of addressing is is to absorb any leak leakage and provide ideal um, conditions for healing. So there's no one dressing that's better than the other, and there's even some debate about the negative wound pressure dressings. Um, uh, there's not there's needs to be more research about those. So um, yeah, just basically. A clean if if there is any infection it would be better to put sterile dressings on but um, just a pad between the, the clothing um, and the wound can be enough just to absorb um, any any leakage um, loose clothing there's also um, a little bit of um, debate about the abdominal binders whether um, in the early days that they're um, advisable because depending on how tight they could actually um, block the blood supply and delay healing. So it may be better to hold off the abdominal binders. You, you can get um, tubi grip, which would be better. That 
um, you know, has a more even spread than the binders. So, um, can you explain what the binders are for people who aren't aware? Okay, well, um, there's belly bands and belly bandit and a lot of different um, varieties and brands, but basically they're, they're, they are um, a deep elastic um, band around the stomach um, that, you know, uh, you can tighten. They've got Velcro. You can just, um, they're designed to help support and, and you know, encourage your shape to return. But um, as I say, um, then they have to be worn um, correctly to avoid blocking off the blood supply. Um, so yeah, they're um, debatable. Mm. Um, the other thing that's really important is to wound assessments. So to actually visualize the wound or the suture line every day, um, which can be difficult without a handheld mirror. So if you just lift the overhang and just check for signs of redness, um, swelling, uh, bruising, sometimes clots form underneath and you'd be able to see a bulge. Um, there can be um, you know, pus oozing if there's an infection, but it's really important to look for those signs of red, hot, swollen sections and any pus, and particularly any foul smelling um, leakage um, or any break in the edges of, of the wound. You know, that needs to be reported immediately because um, an untreated wound infection can lead to sepsis, which is a potentially fatal condition. So it is really important to have your wound visualised every day and checked by a health professional if any of those signs um, appear. That That's a um, really important responsibility. Maybe your partner can keep an eye on it too. And some women even take photos well on the most social media um, support sites there's lots of photos um, taken so you know it may be that you could even take a photo and use telehealth to to get an opinion but um, don't mess with any of those early signs they really need to be reviewed Particularly if you start feeling any flu-like symptoms associated with redness in your wound and fever and flu-like symptoms really, really need to be um, checked. Are there any other things that uh, women or their partners should be watching out for that need medical attention? Well... The, we talked about the DVTs, the clots mm. in the calves before. It is really important that, um, you know, if you, if you notice that or if you have, um, if, the, if the clot breaks off, it may cause a sudden, um, it may be heading towards the lungs, may, may get a sudden cough. All of those sorts of things need to be um, attended you know, and, and I'd go as far as to say, call an ambul ambulance. If you're not an asthmatic and you get a sudden cough and it's associated with, um, you know, pain in the calf, very important to have that checked out. Yeah. Yeah, and there's so much education that's needed for post-op um, after you've had a Caesar, and I'm sure there's more um, that we haven't had time to cover in today's chat. For anyone who's looking to seek information around um, caesarean pre-op, intra-op, post-op, um, you're certainly the person to head for, head to. How do people um, tap into your to your books and and all the things that you're offering around caesarean education? Well, um, the, my contact details are on our website, caesarecare.com, spelt the English way, not the American way, C-A-E-S-A-R, care.com. Um, so my phone number's there. You can also send me an email at e info at caesarecare.com. I am... Um, 
preparing to launch a series of um, masterclasses early next year and um, I've also got a book about to be um, to go to print c-section recovery manual your body your recovery um, I'm, which I'm co-authoring with a midwife in the UK who has um, launched a project called the five guide and that's all about um, the importance of uh, wound care and and remembering that um, you know five five layers five weeks to heal five to six weeks to heal and I've got every reason to um, take it easy and um, yes yeah, so uh, and I'm also um, looking to start a podcast and telehealth calls so if you just want to keep in touch um, that will be um, slowly released on the website and we'll be sure to list Leonie's details on our handy contacts page as well. So uh, if you're wanting to head to, to her and, and to download the book and uh, she's got some fantastic resources there. So um, look, Leonie, what you've shared with us today has just been incredibly valuable information. And I know that um, what you've shared will help lots of parents uh, feel more prepared and empowered for their, for their cesarean birth. And I really want to thank you for that. You're most welcome, Beck. It's um, as you can tell, I can talk and talk on the topic. I'm very passionate about um, equipping women, empowering women, and and also I think um, you know the the current shaming that's going on around cesarean births. Um, you know, calling it the easy way out. One woman was even told that she hadn't given birth because the doctor birthed the baby and things like this. I just want to just tell women who do have cesareans for whatever reason, it's not the easy way out. There's all these things that can cause discomfort and, and grief and that you're a superhero. It's not easy to have a cesarean at all. Um, and some women just don't have a choice. So I think that we should be, you know, really um, aware of that. Yeah. 100% agree on that. There is no failure with birth. No matter how you birth your baby, you will not fail. Um, and we're lucky. I think sometimes we forget that, you know, in many countries where these technologies aren't available, we have not so good outcomes for mums and babies. So we're a little bit spoiled in Australia in many ways um, for the access to healthcare that we get. And for women to be shaming, uh, being shamed for having a cesarean birth is it's almost ridiculous because sometimes the outcomes might be, you know, really dire without it. So um, you're doing great work by educating people around the, the pros and cons of um, cesarean and definitely not the easy way out, but there's certainly some great strategies around making your recovery more, again, empowering and positive as we can, because um, that's important. Birth is birth. Cesarean is birth. So let's hear about how to how to have a, pos a positive experience. So thank you, Leonie. Thanks so much. And um, thank you to, to everyone who's listened in on, on this discussion. And do look out for details on our social media pages for more interviews with experts and friends. But we're aiming to bring the right information from the right people to you. So thanks so much, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you again. Have a great day. Thanks, Leonie. Thank you. Bye. Bye.